Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Spring, and I'm the Honduras Base Coordinator for the Honduras Solidarity Network. The network is um, over when it includes over 30 organizations from Canada and the United States, and um, uh, we formed the network um, shortly after the 2009 military coup in Honduras. Uh, and we focus on examining the role of the United States and Canada uh, in what's going on in Honduras. I myself have lived um, in Honduras, lived and worked in Honduras since 2009, so almost over 10 years. And I work on human rights issues um, and supporting grassroots uh, movements and organizations, once again, focused on um, the role of the United States and Canada in the country. I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you today in person. Obviously being in person is much better than um, looking at a screen and hearing me speak to you that way. And I do apologize and I'm, thank you very much for the patience, for the, the, for the patience of the organizers and people that worked really hard to organize events. Um, I unfortunately had to uh, leave and go back to Honduras earlier than I thought uh, because of a, a personal situation with my partner who is Honduran, um, Edwin Espinal, and uh, he's been a political prisoner. Um, he was in a maximum security prison for almost 19 months, and he was released uh, over a, a little over a month ago on August 9th. And um, the we just found out uh, that the government of Honduras wants to send him back to prison. And because he was in a maximum security prison for so long, he has a whole series of healthcare problems that we really need to address, especially considering now that they might try and uh, send him back. Uh, we were waiting for the um, resolution of the courts, but as many people know, we can't depend on the court system in Honduras because there's really no rule of law. Um, and the government of Honduras is increasingly cracking down on anybody that speaks out, anybody that uh, protests, and so we're really concerned that he might be sent back to prison, and so that's why I uh, had, had to head back early, and that's why I'm not with you today, and I apologize for that. Um, so um, my... While I'm on the topic of my partner, I thought I'd explain a little bit more about about his case, why he's in prison, or why he was in prison, and then how it links to what's going on in the country, the crisis that uh, is sort of continuing to unfold in, in, in Honduras and causing so many people to flee to uh, the U.S. border, um, which is something that when I come to the United States and Canada, you don't really hear anything about. We don't hear about the root causes. We don't hear about people asking, well, why are these people even fleeing in the first place? What's making Hondurans make these difficult decisions as to to flee to the border and, and walk, you know, uh, hundreds of miles to the U.S. border? And and so my partner's case is, is, an, is a good way of sort of talking about um, the crisis that's going on in, in Honduras. So basically the caravans in Honduras started, um, you know, in October of last year in 2018. But, you know, Hondurans have been fleeing the country for, for, for years, um, you know, but individually. And then the caravans started and the caravans came shortly after the... Um, shortly after uh, the 2017 electoral crisis in, in Honduras that was in November of 2017. And what happened is um, the, um, the Hondurans went to the polls. Um, Hondurans decided, you know, participated, participated in their general elections, which occur every four years. And uh, thousands of Hondurans, you know, millions went to the polls and they were, wanted to cast their vote, hoping that um, there would be some sort of change in the country, change in their re daily realities, um, changes in the policies that have driven so many of them to flee the country, which I'll talk about later. Um, and um, there was widespread fraud. Um, the computer systems all of a sudden crashed, and um, the uh, crashed while the uh, the leader of the opposition was in, was winning. And then when the computer systems came back on, all of a sudden the um, candidate presidential candidate that was running for re illegal reelection, Juan Orlando Hernandez, uh, was all of a sudden winning. Um, and so in response, um, thousands of Hondurans took to the streets to protest, um, protest the fraud. Uh, to defend their votes, and as a result, um, state security forces cracked down on protests, 
um, and they started opening firing on protesters. Over 30 people were killed, um, and uh, dozens were sent to prison. Some of them were released shortly after, and but then around over 30 people uh, remained in prison for a long period of time. Uh, most of them in maximum security prisons, like my partner Edwin Espinel. Um, who uh, is is one of the longest standing political prisoners, um, but that is was finally released. But there are actually still eight people that are um, imprisoned. And so the 2017 electoral crisis sparked once again another crisis in Honduras. And Honduras has remained in a constant crisis since the 2009 military coup that was supported by the United States government and the Canadian government. And that's not something you hear about when you talk about the root causes as to why people are fleeing Honduras. Um, and um, it was backed by the United States and backed by the Canadian government. And it's basically sparked um, and, and been one of the root causes as to why Honduras continues to spiral into a crisis um, in the last 10 years. And the 2017 electoral crisis was just another crisis um, in the country um, where Hondurans were trying to change the reality, trying to say, you know what, we can't handle um, what's been going on in the country. We want a change of government. We want to change the political party that's in power, the national party that's been in power since the coup. And they were told basically, nope, you can't. Where the United States government and the Canadian government came out and supported the fraud, they recognized the the um, the election results, ignored the widespread allegations of fraud, and said we are going to recognize the government of Juan Orlando Hernandez. And basically, since then, Hondurans have remained in the streets. Um, they have been protesting and protesting constantly. Uh, they've been protesting uh, the fact that the government has absolutely no legitimacy in the country, that it's being the only reason that it's maintained itself in power is because of U.S. and Canadian support, um, and that Hondurans no longer want um, their, the president to be in power. And so there's been constant protests um, that have sort of maintained themselves uh, for different issues. Every single day there's different, different protests for different reasons. And it's the way Hondurans are trying to change their reality. For the Hondurans that want to stay in the country, that don't flee, uh, they are confronted with bullets on the streets when they protest. They are murdered if they say anything against the government. Um, or they're thrown in maximum security prisons like my partner. Um, and, um, you know, I refer to the case of Berta Cáceres, the well-known environmental indigenous activist um, who was murdered in her home in 2016 for being a very vocal opponent against the government um, and for defending indigenous lands from uh, the illegal construction of hydroelectric dams on indigenous territories. She herself was murdered in her home. Um, for her uh, vocal opposition to the government's policies. And um, she is another example of what happens to people when they speak out against the government and when they stay in the country and try and change their reality. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about protests that are going on today in Honduras. Uh, just two days ago, there were, um, two or three days ago, there were, um, there was a protest in Tegucigalpa, the capital city, uh, where, um, where uh, people were defending their water resources, their water source in the capital city that's uh, under threat. There's uh, massive water shortages in Tegucigalpa that are now, they've now implemented a very strict rationing of water. And so people were taking to the streets and protesting because the mayor of Tegucigalpa, who's part of the National Party as well, the government in power, um, basically uh, handed over a whole uh, big section of this National Reserve Park um, that is the source of water for uh, a large part of the capital city um, to this rich developer who wants to build um, very uh, luxurious homes for the rich, basically, that want to live inside a beautiful forest that happens to be a natural reserve that should be protected. And so people in Honduras uh, took to the street saying, no, you're threatening our water source. Stop the construction of this project. And they were met by bullets and tear gas. And they were, yeah, they were shot at by state security forces, by police, by military um, that I should mention are uh, funded, trained um, by the U.S. government. And... Um, and so um, another example of what happens when with people that stay in the country to try and change the reality is, is uh, for example, um, there was in April of this year, 
there were widespread protests around the country against the privatization of healthcare and education. And so uh, high school students actually are some of the strongest forces that are protesting the privatization of public education. These are students that are, you know, the majority of Hondurans don't have the ability to pay the high cost to for private education. And so they depend on the public health care or the public health care and education system. And so high school students between the ages of 14 and 18 18, um, were taking to the streets and protesting. And I actually was in one of the protests um, one day in the Le Kennedy neighborhood in the capital city. Uh, and I was there all day watching as high school students would, um, they would, instead of going into their classrooms and going to school, like, you know, you would, if you were in the United States or Canada, you show up and you go in and you have your whole uh, day of classes. High school students were saying, no, we need to defend our education system. So instead of going into the classrooms, we're going to go onto the road and we're going to block the road and we're going to create sort of traffic. And, you know, we're, and as, as this is our way of protesting, um, to say no to privatization of our of our education system. And so high school students were doing that and state security forces, police and military would come in and either open fire on them, live bullets, or they would tear gas them. And so this sort of went on the entire day. And you can imagine what happens when young people between the, you know, 16, 18 year olds, you know, take on police forces. I mean, energy, high school students have way more energy than any police and military, um, you know, that's like 20, 30 years old would have. So they sort of maintain this pattern of going in, blocking the road, being evicted by a huge amount of tear gas, and then leaving for an hour and then going back to the road, blocking the road, then being evicted again by police and military, and then dispersing, and then coming back again to block the road. And this went on all day, this cat and mouse game. But in the end of it, at the end of the day, around five o'clock, I was uh, sort of, you know, around the area where the evictions were happening and just sort of, you know, watching about what was going on as a human rights observer and defender. And um, these high school students kind of walked up to me and they had these big plastic bags of um, tear gas canisters and they started to show it, show them to me and they said, okay, there's about four different types of tear gas that they threw at us today that they were firing at us. And um, they wanted to show me that every single tear gas canister set on it made in the United States. And so these high school students said to me, well, look at, you know, instead of purchasing or, or buying and, and taking this money and putting it into our, our education system and buying new, buying our books or, you know, lowering the cost that our parents have to pay to put us in public education, the government of Honduras is buying tear gas from U.S. companies and U.S. companies are profiting and taking our money that, you know, should be going into public services for us, you know, they're profiting and making money off of the, of the fact that we're being repressed and tear gassed by our own government. And this is the words of high school students in Honduras. These are not my words. And so they wanted to show me that as a foreigner, and they assumed that I was American, um, and they wanted to, to make that point that U.S. companies are profiting off of the situation in Honduras, the repression, the violence against that the government is using against people that are staying in the country and trying to change the reality um, of, uh, of, of, of daily life in Honduras. And that's not the only example. Um, so another example is, um, you know, the reality, the daily reality of Hondurans has dramatically changed in the 10 years that I've lived in Honduras. And I've sort of watched the situation deteriorate over 10 years. Um, and it has a lot to do with the interests of U.S. companies. So for example, um, the energy, National Electrical Energy Company in Honduras that was publicly owned and managed by the government, you know, four years ago was privatized. And a lot of the companies that received the contracts to provide, to build dams, to provide, to generate electricity, to then be distributed to Honduran households um, are U.S. companies that are receive concessions to build hydroelectric dams that many communities in Honduras protest and don't want because they deeply affect their water, their water supplies. Um, but, um, and uh, so that, so that, sorry, so the National Electrical Energy Company was privatized, and that has meant that energy prices, so the, the amount of money that I pay on my monthly electrical bill um, has dramatically increased. So in just in two years, my uh, my energy bill has more than doubled. And um, and I'm, I'm not a, a Honduran family that is trying to make ends meet, making minimum wage, which is 
around three hundred dollars, um, three hundred U.S. dollars a month, trying to you know pay these increased um, energy prices. And it's not just energy prices that have gone up, and it's not just um, you know it, gas prices have gone up, which meant which has meant that food prices have significantly increased because so often the the, the standard food basket is very much pegged to how much gas prices are in the country. Gas prices you pay more at the at the pumps in Honduras over double of what you of what you pay here in the United States. Um, and so another example of how daily life in Honduras has changed in the last 10 years is, you know, the healthcare system in Honduras has been so severely depleted in the last 10 years that you know, granted, it was never perfect when I got there 10 years ago. Honduras is a poor country, so they've, you know, it's a struggle to maintain um, a good healthcare system. But it was much better 10 years ago before the 2009 coup than it is now. And an example of that is when Hondurans go to, you know, be stitched up or when they have, ca they need, to, they break, break their arm and they need to, um, they need a cast or when they need cancer treatment or dialysis. Um, for kidney problems, they're going into the hospitals, and the doctors are saying, "Well, you know what? I'm sorry, we can't uh, we can't provide medical treatment for you because we don't have any supplies. So you need to go and you need to buy the needle, and you need to buy the thread to stitch that uh, wound up. You need to buy the the medication that's required to freeze the area. You need to buy the bandages. You need to buy the cast. You need to buy all of that stuff before we can treat you. And so Hondurans are saying, "Well, you know, we didn't have these costs before of living. You know, and a lot of it has to." do with the fact that, you know, the government is totally neglecting the healthcare system, but at the same time, the government, and this is proven, you know, proven, and I'll explain it later, that there are key people in the government and key mafia structures in the government of Honduras that are actually stealing thousands of dollars from the healthcare system. And so the money's not going into investing in healthcare and education, you know, and subsidies for energy costs for, for the regular Honduran family, but that's money that's being stolen from the Honduran people. Um, and, um, and, and, or money that is, instead of investing in healthcare and education, the Honduran government is giving this, these services to private companies in the United States and Canada to provide these services. And, um, and that's causing profits for, um, for these companies, these transnationals and these foreign companies, but it's meaning way higher prices for Honduran families. And so when Hondurans have said, you know, enough is enough, we can't do this anymore. We don't want these policies in place. Our daily living costs have significantly increased. We don't have health care anymore. We have to pay higher fees for our kids to go to, uh, to school. You know, um, we can't do this anymore. We want to change our reality. So when they went to the polls in 2017 to try and change their government that would then change these policies, they were told, nope, by the U.S. government, you know, we're going to allow this fraud to happen. We're going to allow this government that doesn't have any legitimacy stay in power. We're going to ignore the fact that there was widespread fraud, and we're going to prop up a government that Hondurans have said they don't want. And so Hondurans, in so many kids' situations, that are no longer able to deal with the daily reality, that when they try and protest, they get shot at, they get thrown tear, they get fired, tear gas fired at them. They've said, you know what? Well, if we can't vote in our elections, then we're going to vote with our feet. And they start walking to the U.S. border. And it's very unfortunate that that discussion is not happening in the U.S. corporate media about this is why people are fleeing. They can't steal, they can't deal with the daily reality in the country and they can't fight to change the daily reality because they get sent to maximum security prisons, they get killed, they get, you know, shot at on the streets. Um, and that's not, and so therefore they have no choice, you know, there's, there's no options for the Honduran people. And that's in large part because of the U.S. support towards the government. And I just want to talk about who is the United States propping up in, in Honduras? Who, what government, what kind of government are they, are they supporting? And I've already talked about the, the fact that this current government was elected, elected, by, um, you know, through a fraudulent electoral process. But the United States ally in the region is actually a corrupt narco mafia government. And what do I mean when I say that? And what, is that, what does that actually mean? Okay, so I'm gonna give examples. So I say it's corrupt, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some examples of that. I say it's a mafia, so and I already sort of mentioned how they have key people in very specific positions. Um, and I, I'm gonna talk about key people in very specific positions inside the government. Um, that basically means that, you know, key, visit, key, key people in the government, like the president or the president's brother and his family members, can traffic drugs, 
They can steal public money and nothing happens to them because they have key people inside the, the investigative bodies of the government and in the judicial bodies, so in the court system, that stop any sort of efforts to um, receive any sort of justice process or to bring any of those people to any sort of levels of accountability. So I'm going to give an example as to why I say the United States ally in Honduras is a corrupt narco-trafficking government. So, and this isn't just me saying this, um, this is actually um, the New York Southern District Court currently has the brother, excuse me, of the current president, his name is, um, the, the, the brother of the current president's name is Juan Antonio Hernandez, he's the brother of the current president Juan Orlando Hernandez, and he's in jail in New York, and he's accused of trafficking drugs to the United States and in illegally trafficking arms to the United States and then lying to the to US authorities about it. So Juan Orlando or Tony Hernandez, his trial starts in October and he's being accused of not only being a low level drug trafficker, but a very high level drug trafficker. And as we say in Spanish, he's like a capo. Like he's the highest like um drug he's one of the largest drug traffickers um, in in Honduras and in the in the Central American region, and these are all things that are being said in these court documents coming out of the New York Southern District Court. And so, um, in the Southern District Court too, they're saying that they're calling Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president of Honduras, um, a, a CC four or co-conspirator four. So he's named the brother of of Tony Hernandez, is the president of Honduras, is also being named as a co-conspirator of trafficking drugs and arms to the United States as well. And so is the former president. They're all part of the National Party that have been in power since the 2009 coup. But former President Pepe Lobo is also being called a co-conspirator in trafficking drugs and arms to the United States in this New York Southern District Court case. And so that's why I call the government of Honduras a narco government. And now why is it a mafia government? Why is it a corrupt government? I'm going to give you some more examples. So the son of the former president, Pepe Lobo, the, who's named as a co-conspirator in, in these New, this New York case, the son, his son Fabio Lobo, has been convicted and found guilty, um, and he's sentenced to 24 years in prison in the United States for trafficking drugs as well, and taking advantage of the fact that he was the son of the former president, and he used his position to be able to traffic these drugs into the United States. And it's the same with Tony Hernandez, and same with um, President Hernandez, that they use their positions in these powerful positions to traffic drugs in into the United States in total impunity. And Ramon Lobo is the brother of the former president uh, of Honduras, and he was accused of stealing millions of dollars of public money in Honduras for his own personal benefit and depositing that directly into his personal bank account. The wife of the former president of Honduras, Pepe Lobo, her name is Rosa Elena de Lobo. She was just sentenced to 58 years in prison for stealing millions of dollars from a social program that was designed to purchase shoes for poor families and for poor children in Honduras. So instead of taking that money and distributing it and giving it to poor people in Honduras as it was supposed to be, Rosa Elena de Lobo took millions of money, millions of dollars of that money and deposited it into her personal account and purchased houses, nice luxury clothing with it, and you know, did it in absolute and total impunity as well. And so, you know, the mafia is appropriating or taking over the all these different sectors of, of the Honduran government. And Juan Orlando Hernandez himself has placed his allies that are implicated in corruption and implicated in drug trafficking in very key positions inside the courts and inside the investigative structures of the of the government so that no investigations proceed against this mafia that is controlling the Honduran government and that has controlled the Honduran government for the last 10 years. And during those 10 years has received millions of dollars of U.S. taxpayers' dollars um, uh, of support, whether it's for purchasing guns, purchasing bullets to open fire at protesters that stay in Honduras to try and change their reality, or they're purchasing uniforms for military and police in Honduras, um, or um, or they are, uh, you know, or it's a political support that they're giving, saying, you know, I, you know, President Trump and President Obama all came out saying and talking about how Honduran government is such an important U.S. ally, when really, in fact, the United States government has propped up an illegal, corrupt mafia government that traffic drugs 
um, uh, for years in Honduras. And it's interesting because the United States government has justified sending millions of dollars in U.S. taxpayers' dollars to Honduras, saying that they're fighting drug trafficking and they're fighting organized crime. But really what they were doing was propping up a drug trafficking cartel that had taken over the Honduran government. And so that's why people flee. They're fleeing a government that is a, mar a narco mafia government that doesn't allow for Hondurans to protest, that doesn't allow Hondurans to stay in Honduras and change their own reality, that's pushing Hondurans to the U.S. border, um, and they're being and that's being propped up by the United States government. And so that's why people are fleeing, and it's something that you never hear discussed um, in the U.S. Um, uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, press. Um, and so I just want to um, talk a bit about, because one of the things that we do as the Honduras Solidarity Network is we talk about, okay, so this is what's going on in Honduras. Now, what can we do um, in the United States and Canada to support this amazing work that Hondurans are doing to try and change the reality to stay in Honduras, to address the root causes as to why people are leaving Honduras. And um, I mentioned already um, this uh, outstanding activist, Berta Cáceres, um, who the environmental indigenous activist um, who was murdered in her home. It's interesting because the Honduras Solidarity Network, along with you know all these you know amazing folks in the United States, um, have managed to uh, uh, get a law presented in the U.S. Congress called the uh, Berta Cáceres Human Rights Act um, that is calling for the United States government to suspend security aid to the Honduran government while the Honduran government. Um, continues to commit widespread human rights violations. And so this is a way, if we can get this law, if we can get support from our, uh, our congressional representatives and our senators to support this bill and to support this idea, we're actually going to be supporting creating spaces for Hondurans to protest. Because if we cut security aid, to the Honduran government, well, they're not going to be able to purchase more guns and tear gas and bullets and um, and and weapons to repress the Hondurans that are trying to stay in the streets and trying to change and push for a better government that best re that better represents their interests. And so, the Berta Cáceres Human Rights Act in Congress, in the U.S. Congress. Um, says that, okay, we're going to suspend security aid until a certain level of conditions are met. And one of those conditions is justice for Berta Cáceres and other human rights cases that are very important human rights cases. And so it's not only talking about suspending security aid, but it's also talking about dealing with corruption and dealing with the widespread impunity in the country. The impunity that allows for perpetrators of violence and corruption and threats and murders of activists and human rights defenders um, to basically commit these crimes in total impunity. And so the human, Berta Casas Human Rights Act is asking for, um, for there to be a series of steps made for in, in justice process, in a justice process for different, a different number of human rights cases. So I highly um, encourage people in the United States to call their Congress people and to have that conversation with them about this uh, about this bill, the, um, this uh, Berta Cáceres Act, um, in Congress. And it's a way that you know uh, we as um, as uh, U.S. and Canadian citizens um, can basically change our policies uh, here. The problem: Hondurans need to stay in Honduras and protest, and have the right to stay in their country and protest and define their own government, define their own reality, define what kind of development they want, and 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 basically control their own reality in their own country. Whereas we as Canadian and U.S. citizens have to stay focused on our policies in Canada and United States that are preventing Hondurans from doing that. And so we need to work with our congressional representatives and our communities to address the root causes of migration and to have these conversations about how our policies in Canada and the United States are actually causing Hondurans to flee their country. And we, as Americans and Canadians, are actually creating the root causes for migration. And until we change those, uh, the U.S. policy towards Honduras, Hondurans are going to keep having to flee their own country and make that difficult decision and make that difficult journey to the border. And so I wanted to thank everybody. I'm going to close the, down there. I want to thank everybody for coming to the event, 
Thank you for being so understanding about me not being present there um, in person. I hope to return to California, the Bay Area again soon um, to do um, more presentations in person. Uh, people, If people are interested in information about Honduras, the Honduras Solidarity Network has a Facebook page that is updated daily that focuses on the role of the U.S. and Canada in Honduras. It's called Honduras Solidarity Network. We're also on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Honduras SOL. And so people can check us out on Twitter as well. And there's a lot of local groups in California that are doing great work, um, solidarity work uh, that also people in California can connect into. So the Task Force of the Americas is based in California, and they uh, have uh, organized uh, events. They organize um, delegations to Honduras for people that want to go and talk to Honduras. Hondurans hear about the daily reality that Hondurans are living. Um, they organize those types of delegations, so you can also get in touch with them. I think their website is Task Force americas.org um, so thank you very much everyone I can be reached at Karen K-A-R-E-N at Honduras S-O-L dot org if anybody has any questions um, or are looking for more resources about what I spoke about I'm happy to uh, provide those over email thank you very much um, for the space um, and uh, have a great day everybody <laughs>